And <clears throat> I want to stick to more or less to a schedule. I'm not the best at sticking to schedules or timelines. So if I start to veer off course, um, you know, feel free to give me a gentle tap on the, on the, on the shoulder. Can we um, start the group by doing some, like a bow or some honorings? Sure. Sure. Would you like to lead that? Yeah. Um, I want to follow up on a meeting that um, I had with you yesterday, Marco, and just say that I, I really, really um, honor your, your humility and self-awareness and ability to let me um, sort of side with our third party who's like me in certain ways in order to develop a sort of resonance and um, that you were very gracious about that whole thing. Thank you. And that's my bow to you. It, it, um, I give um, Marco a huge amount of shit for being like my husband. <laughs> <laughs> and this other woman in the group who's a lot like me, who's with things in the group because of having to deal with people like Marco. <laughs> I think that was like needed for her. And Marco was really, really gracious about the whole thing. <laughs> Can I say something a little bit crazy? Um, well, Go I don't need to mention, I guess. Um, all right. So in, in the spirit <laughs> of this, this offering, uh, I had the most curious experience uh, I, through our meeting yesterday. This was a meeting uh, between myself, Mary, and Carmen uh, Leilani, who has been like, you know, working with, with me and Jeremy uh, over the last few months. And I was a little bit nervous about getting them in the same space because they're both strong, you know, just kind of kick-ass personalities. Uh, uh, and so I thought when, when you know, when Mary, um, when, um, uh, when, when Mary uh, and I started talking about working together on this, I, I thought I got to make sure that this, you know, I have to introduce her to Carmen and see whether they're like, so they, they mesh or there's just a total or something. Like I just had this fear. Um, but I had this experience and it kind of arose toward the end of the meeting where I just suddenly felt so gifted by like the <laughs> goddess. And for me, that sounds to say, I felt like, oh, the goddess likes me. You know, he's, he's taking care of me. <laughs> I just had this weird experience. And then you like, I realized he's simultaneously. And like, that's one of the things about my husband that irritates the hell out of me. And his ex-wife told me about it. She said, women just show up and take care of him. Women just <laughs> And I'm but like, I'm I, not gonna I, fucking I do that. I do. <laughs> that's one dimension of it. That's one dimension of it because you it's also like, remind me of my daughters. Of me. Right. You also remind me of my daughters in another way. And I realize that there's there one could read a parallel <laughs> into Carmen, who's uh, you know my first daughter's name is Carmen, and uh. And I suddenly aligned you with my, my other daughter, Beatrice, my second daughter, Beatrice, and noticed some, reson some kind of like resonances in the energies, like just something about this. <laughs> like when I, when I first saw Beatrice, Beatrice when I saw is the only character, that, I, that, I mean, that I resonate with. I mean this in, with a thousand percent love. When I first saw Beatrice, come, first saw her, first laid eyes on her as a little, a little baby, right? Fresh out of the womb. She reminded me, she, I, I thought she looked like a gangster. <laughs> I was like, she, she looked like a mob boss. Seriously. That was the first thought in my head. And that's hysterical. Hey, Jeremy. Hey, hey, Marco. Hey, Mary. Richard. Okay, well, hey, let's, Jeremy. Let's, let's do the rest of our appreciation. So I did an appreciation for you. Does anyone else have an appreciation to throw in? You just appreciated the goddess. Yes, yes. And so just to, to wrap that up, on one level, I felt like you're my mother's. On another level, I felt like you're my daughter's. And another level, I felt like you're my sister's. So. Okay, perfect. And another I level, I'm like, that's just my filter. I have four <laughs> crazy brothers, Marco. So, and you're like my husband. So in some way, we're related. All right, so we're all. the same person as my husband. So we were just going to get started, Jeremy, uh, and um, uh, I was going to I was going to wrap for a little bit, and then I'll kind of talk about a, a, a structure for this. Um, but uh, yeah, we were just 
doing appreciations, honoring us. Yes? Cool. Does anyone else have one? I feel like we should go around a little bit. Be a little green mean. Who should start? I think you should. We just did ours. All right. My name is Richard. Uh, uh, just met metapsychosis like a month ago and uh uh I'm trying to think uh i was a monk for six years loved it with the Kamaldolese, part of the larger benedictine order and um uh that, that's about it um, i'm hoping to have my first book or books come out in 2017 got to finish them and publish them so uh that's me in a nutshell so very good to meet you all Good to meet you too. I, I told Richard a little bit about my background before you came on. Oh, uh, hold on a second. Mary and Jer Jeremy, you guys haven't even really met. Um, no, I don't think we have. Right. Hi, Jeremy. Hi. <laughs> oh, shame on me. Uh, Richard, yeah. we haven't met either. But Mary, we've been corresponding a lot. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, so it's good to finally have a... <laughs> A non Facebook face to your face. Right. right. <laughs> um, I have to keep putting pictures of me looking like this on there because um, the way that I act is so aggressive. Um, people think I'm a man and they just start like pummeling me in a, in a male way. And then I change my Facebook um, picture and they just melt down. Oh. <laughs> so interesting. Facebook psychology. Yeah, it is. It is. They're like, oh my God, I've been punching a woman. And I'm like, dude. <laughs> no worries. I'm uh, gonna touch back, and I think I'm winning. Anyway, <laughs> hi. Yeah. So, any anything else, uh, Mary, that you'd want to uh, introduce into the space before we get rolling? No, I want to hear Jeremy's appreciations. My appreciations um, for all of you, everybody here, and everybody's listening, and Marco, and just the whole team that put this together and put Medici together. It's just been really fun. I feel like we've finally created something that that we love and want to see grow and, and um, I feel like I'm just very grateful that it's happening and there's there's other people coming. And it's like if you build like a I don't know, something that you love like a I love coffee. So if I built a, a coffee shop and people were coming in and liking my coffee and having conversations with me and I'd feel like, you know, I've created a real space that's valuable to people and I I share in that value with them. So, so I'm excited about that. It's really cool. It's Good. like a first experience for me. So yeah. Great. Uh, by the way, can I offer an appreciation just because I, I did a self intro, but I didn't do an appreciation. Oh yeah. Can I do that? Okay. Uh, I just want to say appreciation for, uh, uh, for you all and it's good to meet you and thank you for this amazing community of uh, metapsychosis and, uh, uh, just uh, hoping that our friendship will grow and that uh, uh, it will help our world find greater harmony and unity. Amen. 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 Okay, so why don't I share what I had in mind? But before I launch into it, let me just make sure you guys are down with it. And uh, if there's some you know, strong objection or strong, some better idea, feel free to throw it out. Uh, I thought that I would begin with like a 20 minute, 30 minute tops wrap, where I talk about what my vision is for Cosmos Cooperative, why <clears throat> I'm doing this meeting, and you know, what I really, what I hope to see happen. Uh, and then I thought we could go into 15 minutes of question and answer and then 15 minutes of just kind of open response, like not necessarily clarifying anything I said, but more just offering whatever uh, occurs to you to offer, whatever you uh, want to reflect back or contribute to, to the space. Um, and then, you know, we close it, and uh, perhaps I'll ask Mary to, to help us close it in, in some, um, you know, whole, wholesome way. Uh, <laughs> and... Um, uh, and I, I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily uh, expecting any particular action items to come out of this specific meeting. Uh, my intention is to do these meetings regularly, or at least a series of them, to 
kick this process off. So I'd like to do them weekly um, at this time, at least uh, for the next two, three weeks. Uh, I, I then expect to take a break. I'll see, but I expect to take a break because I, I want to finish writing a book myself. Uh, and I think I'll have a window of time in October to do so. And then I want to pick them up again in whatever form you know, they need to take to continue the process until we actually give birth to uh, this organization as a real thing that people can be a part of and participate in and that can do what it is going to do in the world. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what I think a roadmap for that might be. Um, but this is a fluid and inchoate and uh, emergent type of uh, uh, organization. And so, you know, things can change. Uh, and that's okay. They, they're, uh, it's, change is good for us. So is that cool? Sounds good. Okay. All right. Um, well, let me have my obligatory uh, sip of coffee. <clears throat> so, I mean, just to say, like, between us, between whoever, whoever's watching this, I don't have any notes. I don't have a, my, you know, PowerPoint presentation. Um, I just couldn't, you know, I just couldn't contain my thoughts in um, that, you know, a, a frame that would be so quite that limited. That said, I understand that part of the process of becoming professionals at this and kind of making this into a functional, um, you know, successful organization will involve creating structures and creating things like pitch decks and, um, you know, audience development and all the kind of business functions that are not necessarily my specialty and not necessarily what I even want to do, but that I recognize need to be done uh, and that I want to see happen in the best way possible. So, um, so this is to be not to be seen as a business plan. This is not to be seen as um, project management. It's it's as purely as I can make it. It's it's po it's poetic vision, and uh, I want to start from that place uh, because that to me is the flower of what this project ultimately can be. Uh, I ultimately see it as a artistic project, as an art project, as a, an act of poetry or an act of meta poetry or an act of social uh, poetry. And what I want to offer is like an initial vision of, you know, what I think is possible, but then fill it in with some kind of ground plan, some kind of, um, you know, some kind of just initial schema to that allows people to come in and, and add to it what they have to do. You know, their particular gift, interest, passion, skill, um, uh, you know, obsession, uh, or intelligence, uh, maybe. So I think the first thing that I need to say, uh, and I'm going to just also check on the time, make sure that I'm tracking myself, is that I want to do Cosmos Cooperative to fill a need. And in the first instance, at this scale of it, it's feeling a need that I have. It's a need that I feel. And I've been thinking about how to talk about that need. Uh, because it, by objective conventional standards, uh, you know what, I think I should mute uh, you guys while I talk because I'm hearing the background noise. Oh. Does that help at all if I cover the microphone? Does that no. help if I cover the microphone? <laughs> no. I think it's coming from you, Richard. Yeah, all right. So I muted you, Richard, but we'll, uh, we'll open it back up later. Um, so by conventional standards, my needs are not, I think, recognized. You know, if I feel a need, I would describe it with that word, which is a, you know, that, let's, that could be, a, we can inquire into what that word means. If I feel a need to make art, if I feel a need to serve the world in some way, if I feel a need to um, serve the creation or the manifestation of a world that's fundamentally different in some, fundamentally different than the world that we live in, as crazy and mad as that may be, if that's my vision and that's my you know, particular madness, um, you know, that's not gonna be recognized as a need. And the 
product that comes out of that or the activity that that entails is not necessarily going to be recognized as a need in our prevailing culture. That's what makes the situation of writers and artists and spiritual seekers and people that work with interiors, soul workers, that, that kind of people that are inclined toward those types of activities. That's what makes it difficult for them because the culture that we live in predominantly, and it's not an absolute thing, but predominantly honors different things. It has different values. Uh, and we, you know, we, we know that there's tremendous amount of good that comes from capitalism and comes from modern culture. I'm not arguing in any way against the goods and the gifts and the benefits of capital, modern capitalist culture. But at the same time, I think that we do all see, and it's clear as day, the destructive aspects of it and the, the fact that it's a threat to our life uh, and that we, act, we have to take action in the ways that we can to go beyond it. Uh, I don't know how, how else to say it. You know, like I'm working on how to really frame these, these ideas and many people are. Um, so the question is, the question that I came to, like the problem that, the way that I framed the problem is, well, I feel this need and um, I don't know how to meet that need given, you know, the existing structures that are around me, the existing opportunities, the existing platforms or frameworks or even organizations. I mean, I've gotten involved in organizations that purported to, um, you know, to, to do some of these things, like put that, that purported to have some of these values that were contrary to um, the prevailing ones uh, that are so hostile. And, you know, I've had mixed results uh, participating in those organizations. Uh, but the problem is, by myself, uh, there's not that much I can do other than try to make a living and try to make my art. And if I try to make a living making my art at the same time, um, well, basically, let me just put it this way, like that just hasn't worked out for me. You know, and I, I don't see how that is going to work out because I'm not interested in making art to serve commercial purposes. Um, I want to make art to serve spiritual purposes. I want to make art to serve human purposes. And I believe the art that I'm attracted to, the art that has, you know, lit up my life and the art that has obsessed me, you know, from the time that I had my original like eruption of poetic vision as a teenager has all had that quality of transcending, you know, the mundane and the oppressive uh, and the, the um, I think in, you know, in, in, in these times, what we're approaching, the anti-human forces of uh, the world that we've all created together, you know, as a human species. Uh, and so I love this world, um, but I also can envision one beyond it. And what I, um, the, to return to, the, and to return the, the problem that I found is that there's no way to do that by myself. Uh, or at least may, perhaps if I'm lucky, I could write a great novel or something like that, or I could build up my personal brand. You know, I can like do all the marketing work and put together all the systems and be Marco V. Morelli and, you know, be whatever I'm going to be and offer myself on the market as it is, you know, to, to, to gain some amount of success. Right? and to take care of my actual material needs. I'm a family man, I have a wife and two daughters. I have, you know, we have to make it work. We have to make a living. Uh, and, you know, we're, everybody is in that situation unless, you know, you have a trust fund or something like that, or unless you get very lucky and uh, you happen to be, you know, um, know the right people, make the right connections, get a great deal, whatever it is. But most artists, most working artists and most real artists don't, don't actually Encounter, don't, don't have that opportunity. So, so the problem is, like, how can we make a living as artists, as writers, as scholars, as seekers, as, as who we are, as who we really are, uh, in, in, in what I think is a 
relatively hostile, but also a hostile, situ hostile circ context, but also a context at this time, which offers us a whole bunch of opportunities to transmute uh, the conditions into more favorable ones for what we want to accomplish. And so that's where the cooperative idea comes in. It's that if we can put our minds together and if we can contribute the best of what we have to offer, and if we can bring in the business and the technology and the communications and you know, the, the infrastructure and make use of the digital technologies that we have, but hold on to the soul, you know, like keep, make, not only keep, but cultivate a relationship to the soul of what we want to do, uh, that we will be able to create a value that is an order of magnitude or multiple orders of magnitude greater than what a conventional organization or an individual acting alone could do. And um, so where, what we, you know, where we're at now, where I'm at now with this is that today is actually a kind of special day. Uh, today is, um, uh, I got an email a couple of hours before this meeting uh, that um, from our lawyer, uh, Jason Weiner, based in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, and he just registered the co-op with the state of Colorado. So Cosmos Cooperative now is a legal entity. And um, it has one um, member, and that's me. Uh, but as soon as we have, as soon as we have some rudimentary structures in place, and as soon as we have our pitch deck, and you know we kind of know what we're doing, and we bring some core team together to really make it happen. Um, once that happens, then we can open it up and start inviting other members to participate and just start growing it organically and, and naturally. Uh, that's that's the, the intention. So uh, where we're at is that we started about a year ago, Jeremy, uh, with a beta test. Uh, we um, I had pr the previous summer launched a website called theoryofeverybody.com. And I'm not going to talk too much about like, you know, all the different names and all the different websites and so forth. I mean, there's a constellation of, of, um, of entities uh, that we've kind of, you know, put out. Uh, and they've all been in a certain sense experimental, you know, like we've been trying to see what works and what do people want to do. And like, just, you know, we've been working out our relationships, really. Uh, Jeremy it really started with Jeremy and I uh, and Natalie. Uh, last fall, and um, we started with a, a beta book club where we read a book by Ursula K. Le Guin, The, the Dispossessed. And oh God, had, favorite books ever. It's a yeah, it was in a uh, That's an amazing, amazing book. Um, we should talk about it then. Um, we should come back yeah. to it. Um, but it's amazing. We, we started with that group and did that um, through the month of December had a few hangouts, talk, had some discussion on the forum. Uh, I got super into the book. I mean, it was, um, um, as, you'll, as you'll see, like as we kind of like talk about this more and like the ideas sort of unfold, like there, there are elements from the book that are intimate, you know, to the whole conception and the whole like the, the, the genetics, the DNA of the cooperative. Uh, but that was like a test. Like we wanted to see what we can do, test out our, our hangouts and so forth. And then we did a big project, which we called Winter of Origins. And that was a reading of <clears throat> Gene Gebser's The Ever-Present Origin. And uh, Jeremy and I especially worked on, on that. And we had about 150 people sign up to read the book. Uh, we did a series of, I believe, 16 hangouts. We had a whole lot of discussion on the forum. And we, re and we went chapter by chapter and we read the book carefully. Uh, and uh, with, I think, some intensity uh, and had, I think, a really, I had a really profound experience. Like it really, really deeply like landed me. It hasn't stopped landing. Like the implications of reading The Ever-Present Origin, I think, are going to continue to unfold. And that's another aspect of like the DNA, the like genetic formation of, of this whole organism. Uh, and then we took, you know, we had a period of, of kind of of uh, some chaos and some, I think, reorganization. But we, in the summertime, we launched the journal Metapsychosis, 
And that's what we've been going with uh, the, the last two, three months. I should add in there, we also read another book, uh, The Saddlebag, which Natalie uh, led and uh, had a same deal, discussions, um, hangouts, and so forth. So with metapsychosis, though, it, it kind of went to another level because now we were engaging other writers and artists. And we had people submitting, we have people submitting work. We've been publishing the work of, you know, different people in our networks, uh, pe mostly the people that we've already known that, you know, we've reached out to and invited to participate. Uh, and we um, are basically just going week by week now, publishing material uh, and some really, I think, great stuff, like some really promising stuff, but also just the beginning. You know, it's only been a couple of months and, you know, we've been in a conversation amongst ourselves and I think we've been in a kind of meta conversation with uh, our emerging, you know, my, our, our very inchoate community about what we're actually doing and where this is going. And what I think is happening now is that we're taking that conversation to the next level, which is, all right, now that we have some proof of concept, now that we have some sense of what our vision is, now that we have some kind of, we know that what we're doing is, I think, interesting and attractive, like, and that, like, it's promising, that uh, there's spaces for people to, to, to do things that are unique, you know, that are what they are really passionate about. Like Richard, here on the call, you know, you uh, responded to a piece that Chris Jerkies wrote, and wrote like a 20 page, you know, response that brought in uh, your, your biblical study, your spiritual practice, your literary um, um, intelligence. And you brought it all forth and put it into to a paper that I think created a whole resonance between Chris's work and, and your own. Uh, and I see like that, that kind of constellating effect like happening when we kind of be get these minds like in the same space and kind of interacting with some kind of generative structure. But we need to make that sustainable and we need to make it into something that, um, that, that works for, for all, who, all, all of us who are involved. Uh, and you know, in practical terms, that means that we need to raise money, uh, we need to have some kind of a business plan, and we need to create some sense, some kind of an organization that can kind of contain people where they want to be. Uh, and with the energy that they want to, want to give to it. So um, I, I did a talk, a podcast with Benita Roy uh, a few months ago. And uh, her, the, the, the idea that she's working on is called the Open Participatory Organization. And, um, you know, I'm not... I'm not like gr gr grabbing a model wholesale and saying like, like this is an open participatory organization, you know, that that's not the idea, but there were some ideas of like, it, in some of the, some, some strands of what we talked about that I found really relevant to what I, I want to do and what I feel that we want to do or we could do. Uh, and that's the, the idea that really the organization doesn't subsume you like that the organization, like the organization you're a part of doesn't, try to contain you, that it has this kind, these kind of borders that are this porousness that allows people to come in and go out and flex and flow. And that the way that the organization is structured and the agreements that people make and this, the, the flow of it, like the mind jazz of it, right? The music of it, we could say, the organization of it, like allows people to have a relationship which is most supportive of their creativity and their interests. Uh, the details of how we do that, though, are, I don't have. Like, I just got like the, the sense for like what the intention would be in creating this. Um, but, um, I'm gonna just, I wanna pause there for a second and just kind of look at my, um, look at a, a page that I put up on infiniteconversations.com, uh, it's, it's in the category or the channel Cosmos Co-op, Cosmos Co-op, and the document is called CC Core Concepts Overview and Contents. And what I basically put there is like a list of ideas that I've been 
working with or brooding over and kind of just talking about in different places over the last year. And I just put them all on the list. And the idea that I had, I haven't really actually got to it, is that I would go through each of these ideas and kind of create a post about it. Uh, so, that we, so that for those who want to, we could discuss um, those ideas and like flesh them out and then build them into what ultimately will be um, essentially like a constitution. Or uh, I'm also thinking about it in terms of like source code. Like if we were building this comp, this co-op as um, a sort of social software, like a sort of social engine, like what would be the code? What would be, you know, how, how would it work at, at, a, at, a, at a core level? And then how could things plug into it? You know, how could people like develop their own projects, their own ideas in relationship to, to this code? Um, and so the, um, the, like the core of the idea is that we have a, an organization or a platform uh, that can, one, provide a social space where uh, people like us could get together and other creatives could get together, but two, also provide some actually practical resources for people. Uh, the stuff that you would have to do on your own if you were going to be a solo artist, like your, you know, like set up your, all of your marketing, build up your whole email list, um, do all of your social networking, um, you know, get critical feedback, get editorial support. I mean, all the kinds of things that go into building, you know, a career as an artist. Could we provide a common set of resources that we ourselves manage and maintain that we share amongst ourselves and offer to each other? to support our respective, our respective projects. And then could those projects uh, become opportunities for us, you know, to, to you know, pursue our, our, our visions, our respective visions, and then feedback and support the co-op as a whole so that the thing creates an ecosystem, creates a context that is self-sustaining and, and at least supportive of our individual initiatives. So, um, how exactly we do that? Uh, there, like Mary and Carmen, have a lot of experience with organizational structures and with business plans and so forth. So I'm not going to even try, you know, to figure out all the details. Like I'm going to try. I'm going to invite others to come in and help us actually, you know, operationalize uh, what this is. But what I would like to propose and I'm gonna wrap up like the next, in a few minutes, is some kind of guiding ideas or some kind of core ideas that I would like to see like as really part of like the DNA of the project. I have one that I wanna bring in and it's literally related to DNA. So okay. this is a place to transition. Um, not quite yet. I just, I just wanna mention a few concepts okay. from this list over here. And then, you know, like, and then, uh, Maybe allow that question period and then allow whatever else you want to add to it. Uh, it's actually a wiki. So it is the kind of thing that we can start to collaborate on and, you know, sort of build out in a collaborative way. Um, the, fir the first one, though, is this idea of creative democracy. Um, you know, I think one of the lessons of this summer, you know, this political season, one of the lessons I'm drawing from it anyway is that we can't wait and we can't expect uh, our government to um, give us democracy. Uh, and, you know, that's not a blanket condemnation. Uh, there are a lot of places where democracy works relatively better than, than in others. You know, I think that on the whole, um, plan on a planetary scale, you know, we're nowhere near anything like democracy. Um, but at least in our respective national contexts, like in the United States, uh, I think that it's a mistake to, to, to look to the government for democracy. I think we need to do it ourselves. Uh, and I think we need to start with like our core relationships, our work relationships and our creative relationships. And so this idea of creative democracy, it actually comes from John Dewey. He wrote an essay in the late 30s um, 
called Creative Democracy. And his view of democracy is that democracy is something that is practiced. It's something that people do on a very, on a very local, uh, on a very immediate level. And then it has different scales, right? There's, there's you know, your work democracy, there's your city, you know, your city uh, government, state, national, and so forth. But really, it's a way of life. And, you know, there's always been this tension between uh, the artist and the democratic ideal because you know, great artists seem to come from, from genius or from, you know, the individual. Uh, and the democratic kind of context can be seen as, uh, you know, a leveling down, um, a, um, a diminishment of that individual vision. But what if we had a different vision of, of what democracy is about? Like, what if we saw democracy itself as creative? And what if we saw our participation in democracy as a creative act? Uh, and what if we saw democracy as supporting our individuality and our creativity? Could we actually embody that? Could we actually enact that? Not, not at the level of, you know, the United States, at the level of ourselves, at the level of, of our networks, our organizations, this organization. Like, what does that look like? And that is essentially the, what, the way that I see the cooperative um, evolving is as an actual democracy that has the features of a democracy, which involve education, which involve uh, conversation, which involve uh, the free play of thought, which in involves the free play of identities, uh, and which I think ultimately involves also an economy that is con controlled by the people who it most impacts, us not by the one percent or not by some other group that doesn't have a stake in the game that doesn't have to live with the consequences of of, of, of the decisions that we made. so i think i'm i know i'm beginning to rant a little bit about this but um but the idea of a cooperative is to act is to create a creative democracy in actuality on our scale on the scale that we actually can manage and then to you know make that open source and show people how we do it and experiment with different, with different approaches and see what works and what doesn't and make it a learning experience so that other people who may not be attracted necessarily to what we want to do or who, who may not be, you know, artists and writers and, you know, weirdos uh, like us, but, you know, maybe, maybe they're a group of therapists. I mean, maybe they're a group of, um, you know, small business owners in, in any other industry that they can start to re-empower themselves to own their own platforms, to own their own means of production, uh, to create their own democracies. And so we kind of start building this real political movement from the ground up. That's kind of the idea of, of the co-op uh, and why the cooperative structure I feel is appropriate to this kind of endeavor. Uh, and, um, you know, that we're gonna, t I have a whole bunch of, I have a whole list of items here that, that you know, we can discuss and I can, I hope address in, in future meetings, um, but that's the that's the core idea, and um, so so we are going to have some kind of membership, and our our business model is going to depend on some kind of a membership where people kind of chip in to help sustain us, uh, and I see th four diff three different levels of membership, one and, and membership has a specific meaning I should say. In the cooperative, it actually has it actually is legally a piece of how the cooperative is organized. Um, but the cooperative will be owned by these these this, these layers of membership uh, by the the workers at the core, the people who are making it run, you know, day in day out, who are doing the editing, putting up the the media, who are organizing meetings, who are you know, if this were a food co-op, it would be the, the staff and the management. Um, and then the next layer, a larger layer, the creative contributors. Uh, those are writers, artists, filmmakers, conversationalists, um, like anyone who has something creative to contribute that resonates with, you know, our overall vision. Um, they would be in this creative membership. And then the largest sphere of membership uh, would be our, our community in general, our supporters, our um, uh, participants in events or in conversations, the, the people who consume our 
our art and our writing and so forth, and really just the, the people who are friends of uh, the cooperative, friends of metapsychosis, uh, and um, who you know want to see this happen because they want they want to be able to participate on. It. They want this in their life. This is valuable to them. Uh, and each membership has, a, in the way that we're structuring the, co the cooperative and that um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about further, each membership will vote for representatives to a board of directors. I don't know if we'll call it the board of directors because it's not a really poetic name, but in the, you know, the legal documentation, it will be a board of directors uh, that will have uh, between uh, five and seven people. And that board will, be will have a certain set of encoded assigned responsibilities uh, and um, will be in a constant dialogue with each other and with the membership to determine the steering and the direction uh, of the co-op itself. So uh, I'm going to be a, a director for a period of five years, uh, after which time um, I can either run for re-election or I could let go and you know do something else maybe just go to being a, a creative contributor who knows uh, but once we establish the basic structures and once we invite membership i'm estimating at the at beginning at the in november between november and the beginning of next year then our next step will be to have elections to um to fill out the board and then to determine you know our core staff uh and to um really just start to focus on building out the co-op and building out the business side of it. And I'm going to talk, I think, in a, in a future talk about this idea of a virtual currency, which I'm calling Litcoin, and um, the, the specific member benefits and the specific kinds of capital. Uh, because I'll just make a footnote to this. I mean, one of the things I want to do is, well, let's put it this way. Uh, you know, the problem that I have and so many others have is money making money, having enough money, having money to pay our taxes, to buy food. Money is made up though. The dollar is a fiction. It's a fiction that is an incredibly powerful, but there's no reason why we can't make up our own money and then imbue it with its own power through our own consciousness, you know, through the value of what we create and bring into it. If we create a valuable organization, an organization that's producing great art and great films, great books and having these great these you know these, these conversations that that go deep uh that really like nourish us at a soul level that really you know come up with uh imagine new possibilities of the world and then take take pr uh, precipitate action uh that uh, it brings about some some of these you know some of these seedlings of the world uh that that we want to see um will create value and that value will, will become um, attached to, you know, it will, it will adhere to, to our own currency. So I'll talk about Litcoin next time. Um, but uh, but that, that's, that's basically the plan. And that's basically my kind of rambling vision for it. Uh, and uh, the next steps are gonna be to flesh out the vision and to bring more people into the conversation and then to start you know, creating the actual structures that are going to allow people to function um, in a, you know, enjoyably and happily and um, uh, creatively, I hope, uh, to you know, collectively kind of bring, lift ourselves to uh, a healthier place. So I'll stop there and open it for questions. Questions. I do want to say though that when I was at Marlboro, my work was um, I was working in molecular biology and interpreting that in dance, and um, I got very interested in cellular intelligence. And at the Marine Biological Labs at Woods Hole, I worked with um, Gunter Albert Bueller, who is the person who has done the work demonstrating that cells think and they make decisions and that um, tissues arise, and this is an extrapolation from his work, he didn't actually say this, tissues arise when cells, for whatever reason, decide to, to cooperate with each other. 
So when we think about how tissues arise in uh, a multi multi organ um, being, any kind of an, uh, being from the eukaryotic cell which has organelles in it on up, um, it's because for whatever reason, it's as if the different cells decided that they were going to work together, and that decision resulted in bio biological fitness. And I think that um, we, we think about the body as an automaton, even the most conscious of us. When we think about the liver, we think about what the liver does. We don't think about how the liver got to be a liver. And that actually the cells making decision to come together and collaborate is a really, really crucial point. And um, one of the, the most powerful moments of collaboration is when the sperm enters the cell and they become one organism in, um, in, in gestation. And at that moment, there's a massive release of light. Have you guys seen the research on this? There's like literally light that can be captured. Mm -hmm. And I think that this model is very crucial for me with all of the study that I've done since then of alternative currencies, I edited a book on it with Tom Greco, um, uh, studying you know Berkshire Bucks, all of the different people who've done these kinds of exchanges, studying different forms of um, government and organizational development, studying Dewey. I went to a Dewey college and then I worked at another one. This seems to me like it's a place that's really important for us to start. I'm just throwing that out there. Hmm. In, in the dispossessed, the, so the the social organism is like one of the, the anarchist philosopher Odo's like ideas. Right. And you know, she, she sees the different, it's the, the different members as uh, cells in the social organism. Well, I read, um, I read um, Le Guin while I was at Marlboro and studying at, uh, and, and working at Woods Hole and learning about the Gaia hypothesis and studying cellular evolution and all that stuff. So this is returning to roots for me. Cool. So anyway, but I, I think that's an important place to look at. And it's the, um, it's the, it's looking at what is our desire and how does that desire motivate us to actually engage with one another and to actually create tissues that then create organs within an organism. Mm -hmm. How would you articulate that desire for yourself? Um, I think that it's, uh, I'm made up of eukaryotic cells, which are in themselves collectives of other cell lineages that came together and um, they became embedded with one another. And every human cell has within it organelles that are, were cells that were free living and that were evolving in a different level. And because I am made of those cells, I have a tendency and an inclination, which is a, um, uh, which is a, um, magnification of that cellular energy to be part of something greater. And there's like this sort of numinous penumbral experience that I have and that other people I know who are, you know, kind of um, actualizing individuals have to, to become part of something greater. And I think that we can look at this from cellular intelligence without having to invoke any occult or religious religious mysticism at all mm. and to say this is the way that i am because of, this is the, what i'm made of this is the stuff that i'm made of whatever generated that in the first place so i want to be part of something bigger um and i think that most of social organ organization human social structures are based on this compulsion to be part of something bigger and um i think that it's a really intensely powerful survival technique, uh, you know, strength in numbers. Um, yeah. But it, it evolves in lots of ways that are negative. I would like to go back to the basics of it and just acknowledge this, admit this, and work with that desire in mm -hmm. people and work with it in a way that um, brings in some understanding of um, evolution of multicellular beings and um, to sort of like take it from a, from out of the compulsion and look at it from the choice level, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Well, a lot of people have gotten burned just being part of, you know, big vision projects. Yeah. 
uh, like this. I mean, I'm certainly in that camp. Um, yeah, I have. So, um, but that hasn't, that hasn't eliminated the desire that I have to. We have this desire and I think that desire is a place to start from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think also though it does, it, it is, it, sh it, it should be a sobering kind of note because I mean, it is important, the structures that we build at the beginning of, you know, the, the, the initial conditions that we create yeah. uh, are going to be part of determining like how things go. Uh, so, right. you know, that was also one of the reasons why I thought the cooperative idea was good because let's say I create something and it's my thing. Yeah. And it's like, I, I'm, I own it. You know, maybe I say, oh, this is cooperative because I co-op, you know, I cooperate with everybody. But in fact, I actually own it. Like then when, you know, the shit hits the fan and when push comes to shove or when conflicts arise, which happens and when people kind of, you know, we are all um, human, right? Uh, then because there isn't an, an actual structure in place to contain that dynamic, you know, because it always defaults back to me then at the end of the day, I can take my ball and go home, you know, or I could start acting like a jackass and um, firing people or whatever it is. I don't even want to put myself in that situation. Uh, I, I, I don't want to be in that role. Uh, and I feel like, you know, it would probably destroy me ultimately to be in that kind of a role. But um, if we acknowledge that that's just the reality of our human nature, uh, as much as the desire for, being a part of something or cooperating is a reality of our human nature, then we could just kind of put, you know, put our ideas on the table, I think, put our experiences on the table and say, look, how can we do, we, we can't help but be in this predicament. So how could we do it better? Uh, that's all we can do, I think. And, and um, I think though that if we are you know, mature enough generally you know conscious enough generally maybe not all the time maybe that you know if we're of good faith if we have good faith uh and you know i think this the spiritual aspect of it is really important like pretty much everybody who's going to be attracted to this has some spiritual sensibility mm -hmm. however you want you know however they articulate it in many different ways of articulating that um but some some practice or some sensibility at least uh that if those elements are in place then I don't see why we shouldn't be able to work it out. And if we can't work it out, who, who the fuck is going to? <laughs> right. Oh, go ahead, Richard. Um, I just have a question about the list that you spoke about that's at Infinite Conversations. Could you post a link to that at the site for this conversation? And sure. maybe we could all have access to that yeah. in the next days? Yeah, Great. for sure. Great. Is the reading list? What list? Uh, oh, you, Mary, you're, I don't even think that you have an account yet at, at the forum. It's at infinitconversations.com. So I'll, I'll um, send you a link. and. Um, well, um, I've to, written down um, four different organizations, and I need to understand how they relate. There's Cosmos Cooperative, Infinite Conversations, and Metapsychosis. Right. Um, should I lay that out? Um, I would rather... Um, do you have it written down anywhere? Yeah, it's, uh, it's on this list. And, and okay. part of the idea is that this, this, this list, um, I'm calling it a core concepts list. It's, it's basically a glossary of these different um, okay. entities and ideas. Yeah, it's, it's just a list at this point, but we, you know, my intention is to fill it out okay. over the coming weeks. I'm very interested. I look forward to uh, to learning more, and uh, I'm going to have to take off in a couple of minutes. But I'm definitely interested in learning more, and uh, would like to speak with you guys about it. Sounds very interesting. All right, thanks, Rich. Thanks, Richard. Okay, so I wrote down pretty much everything you said, Marco. I just kind of transcribed. Okay. Um, because I need to get to structure sooner rather than later. So I'm going to start filling out, you know, and everything you said fitted to the basic categories that would go in a business plan slash pitch deck. Mm -hmm. Business categories of organization, purpose, vision, um, 
roadmap, next steps. This is not in the right order. Stakeholders, business model, membership to funders, stakeholders, um, financial model, membership development strategy, competitors, et cetera. Yeah. So, um, and I'm going to be working on that with Carmen. So I'm going to just start slapping things into these categories so that we can create a sort of summary for people who are coming in. Mm -hmm. And I try to capture a lot of your sort of um, poetic vision so that that can be used partly in this and then, you know, wherever else is needed. Uh, interview with the founders, um, text for um, fundraising video and so forth. Yeah. That, that was a bit of a rant, I, I, I know. Like that wasn't necessarily a well-structured. It, was it was another, yet another air manifesto and my life is full of them. <laughs> Well, well, there is some concretion behind it. Uh, yeah, sure. And it's fine. I wrote it down. I mean, I, that, that air manifesto came from a lifetime of experience and work. And I know that it's written down in lots of places, but sometimes it does have to just kind of breathe in the air a little bit more before it fully gets written down in four words. And so I just captured it without making a big deal of the fact that I was to see if mm -hmm. there's anything from, you know, that it, if, see if it's um, really flowered enough yet so that any of that's useful. Yeah. I mean, part of what I want to do is like, I want to do these meetings every week. And, you know, as we kind of, one person described it like as, uh, what was it like when, 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 when like a plant grows in like a crack between like two rocks or something, like you get like one piece of sand in there and then another piece of sand, you can get enough little particles and then you get the seed and something starts to grow and becomes bigger. So these are grains of sand, uh, essentially, right. uh, to something that, it, it, you know, the life takes root will right. grow, grow bigger. Uh, but for me, I wanted to just be, I want to get comfortable just wrapping it out. You know, I want to get comfortable yeah. being present and being just, you know, spontaneous and having it in me instead of referring back to notes and yeah. getting too mechanistic about it. Yeah, the whole, um, the, the, I understand the phase that you're at. That's what I'm saying. Okay. I'm I get the phase. It and seems some of it is still worth capturing down because there's phrases in there that, so every time you do it, something different comes out of it as it gets more comfortable to you. Mm -hmm. And just because it's getting more comfortable doesn't mean that you're feeling really the best stuff it put up and said two or three times earlier. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> I've got to sign off, folks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye, Richard. Bye-bye. Talk to you soon. Hey, Richard. Thanks, y'all. Um, okay, so um, in terms of my contribution here, uh, Jeremy, I don't, you don't know anything about my background. Um, I started out as an artist and then I um, um, studied molecular biology and dance and then I became an opera singer and an occultist and then a writer and then I started having businesses of various kinds and I had this big vision starting really young that I was going to be doing visionary businesses that would be transforming the world through art so I did a couple of those and um, they were interesting and I you know wrote for national international journals I didn't have any college degrees I never graduated from college so um, from, from my undergrad so later on I started working for organizations like Prescott College which is a Dewey based school it's based on Goddard um, and uh, I finished I got a bunch of degrees paid for by working for colleges and um, worked for NPR, raised money, did a bunch of editing, edited journals. And so, but at the same time, I'm an interdisciplinary artist and I write poetry, um, sing, I'm a dancer um, and choreographer, and I create operas that have all of this stuff in them and also produce them. Um, but the one job that I told Marco that I really miss was being an editor because it's so intense because you have to um, you have to somehow wrest a shared collective editorial vision out of a group of people and then create a plan for that and actually find people to fit into it and train them to be writers and or edit their work and or motivate them and keep them going so that you actually have things showing up in their appropriate slot to get something published. So um, I'm interested in um, advising at least until there's funds with raising the money, which I've done a lot, um, so that you can have an editor for metapsychosis and being a potentially a part of that team or like an executive editor who keeps all that going. 
I'm very easygoing about content. I like to have a shared vision with people. And I'm not usually like, I have to have this piece if other people have good ideas or, you know, if we start at the beginning that people are sharing that, that's great. Um, I do need to make some money if I'm going to be doing this in addition to the other projects I'm doing. So, um, but in the meantime, as I told Marco, I also like the organizational development part. And for 20 reasons, I'm interested in this organization and I'm happy to help with um, basically the strategic planning process, which is what I'm doing by being here, listening, writing things down and helping to create a shape. And for, because of the size of the organization and where it is, it's very crucial that there, need, that there start to be some fun so that you can kind of get some life support going here. Um, and so the pitch deck is like a, is, a, is a down and dirty way to get to a business plan something you can share with others but it's also an outline of the structure so i've committed to work on that with carmen so that's kind of me <laughs> any questions no that's great i'm uh grateful that you're helping out with with that end of things um the practical end of things to actually help us keep going um yeah being so yeah. an editor is like it's that is that is a no shit job it is really fucking hard work and i like it because it's so challenging to pull all those pieces together and make it happen i love doing that and i like working with a team and you need to have people who've actually done it and understand the stress and the grit of that i think oh yeah you know what i'm saying yeah yeah and i was i was an editor for a few years with the reality sandwich and that was very oh yeah Right. interesting and, and stressful environment but um i appreciate anybody who's who's done it before and probably done it with bigger organizations um that kind of understands what the kind of energy you need to to have for something like that so um it's great to have any kind of involvement that you can give us at this point uh be awesome so cool. hey, let me ask, you know it's top of the hour um and i just want to check in like how much time you guys have because you know jeremy and i we've uh, been trying to get into a habit of doing an editorial meeting uh, on Tuesdays and uh, our schedule had it later in the day, but we all happen to be here. Uh, so if you have time, we maybe we can just move into an editorial meeting or a meta editorial meeting. If you want to, um, you know, participate in that, uh, Mary, since you're, you know, since we're all here. Well, um, I haven't seen any of the content. Um, I mean, I've seen the publications of the journal, but I haven't seen any of the content to discuss. And I still have this, I feel like I need you guys to look honestly at my poetry and see if, um, if you think there's anything in there that's valuable to publish. And if so, what? Because that is a big agenda for me as I have probably a thousand poems and I have not found a place that I actually want to publish them. Hmm. I'll, I, can, I looked at one piece. Okay. And I liked it. Okay. Was That's it that first one I sent you, the one that I just like whipped off this week? Uh, you mentioned uh, so there were three or four Japanese oh, artists. Palimpsest. Palimpsest. That was the one that you well, looked at? The, Palimpsest. A particular Japanese artist. Um, oh, Ukiyo-e. Yeah, yeah the, the sky. Yeah, yeah. That I was like, a love poem to my, my crazy Pisces before my husband. Oh, okay. That's why I liked it. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm sure that's why. Uh, so... Yes, that, that, okay, good. I'm glad you liked that. There's mm -hmm. a lot of my poetry is like that. I go back and forth between the rawness of immersion and physical experience and the unavoidability of that and the yearning for um, the, the inchoate and the mystic. And all of my work is about that continuum and how to make them work together. Mm -hmm. It's pretty standard stuff for a mystic, but I happen to have a ridiculously huge education that I bring into it as well. So anyway, I figured uh, there would be stuff there that you'd want to publish. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think that we'd I think want to so. publish. I think so. Yeah. Okay. I got to yeah. take a look. It sounds okay. good to uh, me. I, put, I, I created a folder in the submissions uh, folder uh, for Mary Lynn Poetry. So it's, it's all there. Uh, and, uh, for free. And, and one of the things I want to offer is that um, a lot of my poetry is very dense. I mean, I'm kind of, I, I do, do tend to an Ezra Pound-esque sort of, um, Irv, and um, I'm happy to do some artistic kind of expansions of the poetry, make it more approachable for people. 
Do you know what I mean? Like an accompanying poetic mm -hmm. essay mm -hmm. as needed mm -hmm. as an experiment. So if you see anything that you like, but it, and it's intriguing and you want that treatment, because the poems exist in and of themselves, but they, they do have layers behind them that, you know, the modern reader is not very literate and sometimes that extrapolation is just needed. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so, but that's, so that's a big piece for me, but I don't want to get into content with you guys until you've looked at that and you have a sense that this even makes sense that we're going in the right direction. Because if I'm not working on this, I'm going to be working on the Green Fire Review and I'm just going to get that publication up and it'll be mm -hmm. me doing that. So that's not that's not a threat. I'm just letting you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, <laughs> sure. no, right? cool. no, I uh, I have so, a good feeling about it. That's all I can okay, say. Uh, but I also just want to live with it for a little while too. I mean, I yeah, like yeah. to chat with poetry. I don't like. I I don't want to just kind of get into this production and like assembly line kind of mentality. You know, oh, like, yeah. um, I think that it's you know things have their time, and it's best as as an editor. And the way that I want to be an editor is like is is i want to be in relationship with the work you know i want to be i want it to be a, a dialogue and i want it to to feed into my own creative process yeah uh, so that it really becomes synergistic and um and like that sort of metapsychosis idea of like minds you know feeding off of other minds like is act we i actually actualize that like in in my practice uh but it is hard work for sure you know and uh, you get stuff that has potential but it's very raw uh yeah. and you get other stuff that's like really well done but it doesn't have a lot of juice uh and you know as jeremy and i have discussed previously like part of what i think we see as our sort of job is just helping to, sh to shape those flows or helping to guide those right. flows in some way well i mean that's what editors do um, if you want to have a little talk about editorial philosophy, we could do that right now. If you want to use the time to do that. Sure, we could do that. I, I got to run in like in like 20 minutes for a phone call. It's okay. so 430 here, but I think we could just talk for a few minutes about that. What we see is an editorial philosophy. I like that. Mary, I'm really curious what yours is. And, and I feel like um, you've got well, I, um, I always, everything comes from me from um, contemplation and from what I know is my deepest truths. And um, I know that I, um, I'm only able to do art and bring art to other people because we're so similar inside. And whether there's a mystic relationship to that or that it's just that the cells that created this cooperative that is the multicellular human being are so eager to resonate with one another and to be cooperative that we resonate like fucking hell with other human beings. And we're so eager to have um, like create resonating structures like the mirror neurons. Mirror neurons is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I want to find those places where people feel like they really are inside of it with each other. That's really important for me. And um, that we are, can also, um, and part of that is that um, we don't always want all resonance on the time. We want, to, we want a growing edge. And so what are those growing edges? So for me, an editorial philosophy is a group um, kind of, you know, mind session where we talk about what we think are the exciting ideas, what will excite our audiences, what excites us, and then we just come up with a plan for what we're going to try for the next year. You know what I mean? And uh, like we want to have a whole session where we talk about, or we want to have an issue that has loosely based on theories of consciousness, or another issue that's loosely based on, I'm just throwing this out, um, based on um, interpreting global crisis you know or whatever and then we open our minds and we just challenge our audience to do their best to come up with wild creative shit that resonates with that and that has a good balance between stimulating our resonators so not only do we not feel alone we feel empowered because we feel the greater than us that's out there and also challenged to learn something new or to challenge our own concepts of our little self as part of the big self I'm sure that on another day, I would have said that all much more simply and articulately, but basically that's it. That's my, that's my editorial philosophy. 
another piece that I have to throw in is that, you know, I have a ton of orange meme. I really hate sloppy shit. I really hate shit that, um, that doesn't use form simply because the person doesn't understand it. I like it when stuff does that magical transcendence of form and there is just, um, or uses form so brilliantly well in a way that seems like it could almost be didactic. And then because it uses it so well, the magic transcends it. Um, and that means I like to work with people who really seem to actually have a sense of grammar and logic and structure but I can sit back and see that in, in, in a um, poetic sense. And um, I know that Marco, from reading your work, that you're very similar to me in this balance, called the Dionysian Apollonian balance. And um, it's important for me to work with people who share a similar level of kind of education and rigor about what the actual forms are. That's all I can say about that. While being an artist. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's yeah. why there's always going to be there's always going to be the, the tension between yeah, and there should and be energy. If there's no tension, yeah. then it's not really yeah, no dog roll for me, unless okay. it's incredibly badass. You have to really convince me with dog roll. I think you know. I I also like if I could add just a tidbit of my philosophy. Like I okay. I think that you know showing up like, like even with like our kind of ragged ideas, you know, and even sort of our, our half, our uh, imperfect expressions. Like it's worth, we could, you know, we could be, I think, discerning about this, but it's often worth kind of throwing things into the mix and seeing what happens. Like experiments are useful, I think. Um, yeah. Creative friction is useful. Like yeah. if it's held, you know, within a shared intention to ultimately bring forth something of, of truth, beauty and, and goodness and so forth. Um, so, that like the intensity that comes from different, very, you know, very, who couldn't be intense minds and coming together and, you know, dancing uh, or, you know, doing whatever, doing their, you know, Kung Fu or whatever it is that they're bringing to the space. Um, I think like that is like, in some senses, like the essence of, of the creative process is um, it, it comes from a, what a, it comes from what you can call like an agonistic cooperation. Right. Uh, uh, and the cooperation, I think, is more important ultimately. But it, 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 without that agonistic element, uh, it will become very pale and stale and kind of dead. Mm -hmm. uh, the, in the theosophical tradition, that um, is considered the qualities of the fourth ray. We can get to the rays on the time, but um, articulate it as harmony through conflict. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really important to me. That's the hallmark of the artist. And that you can bring all of your technique and all of your opinion, but it, if there has to be that, you have to be an N in Myers-Briggs, you have to have an, the intuitive sense and you have to just bring that in, indefinable knowing that it's a yes or no, and you can't justify it in the final analysis. It either has that quality, that agonistic quality or it don't. Mm. Yeah. That's interesting. I don't know if I have a good succinct statement for my philosophy, but I certainly do look for something. Uh, works of art and philosophy and critical thinking that leave room for that kind of unknowableness or the, that intuition. And um, I look for, in my own writing, and I'm always kind of reworking things because my critic is kind of going in and going, okay, this needs to be more intellectually rigorous. But then the poet's going like, just let it out. There's this energy, this connection. Um, but I've noticed that really the most um, successful or at least the most fulfilling creative works are ones that balance the two. So I don't crash and burn and not able to create the form that this body of work needs, but also uh, that I'm not stifling that form with this you know, too much uh, left brain, so to speak, sort of thing. Um, so I don't know, this, as a philosophy, that's what I look for in, in my writing. And I'm gravitating towards people who can do that in their writing. And uh, metapsychosis as a whole, I think is interesting editorially speaking, because we're looking for people who can do that and can kind of come in with something that's 
hopefully well written and interesting and touching pop culture or touching the sort of cultural studies in a way that's engaging beyond kind of a niche uh, community, but also kind of leaving that weirdness to it, you know, that kind of unknowableness to it, sort of a like a Trojan horse uh, kind of idea of just sort of opening up into the uncanny, uh, which he thought was something about pop culture. Like David Lynch is a good example, more uh, popular ideas uh, in different media. But yeah, so so that's sort of my my sort of navigating principle. Um, between the weird and the strange and the sort of mystical contemplative, but also the the cultural studies, the cultural critique, yep. uh, the philosophical critical theory, and just sort of like that strange, um, I don't know, infinite loop, or is it is this a mystical text or is this like kind of an intellectual text? I don't know. And that's probably why I'd bring up Gebser uh, as well, is why I loved Gebser as, uh, in his writing in uh, Ever Present Origin, uh, because it's so intellectually, uh, satisfying and yet it's also deeply mystical um and Le Guin of course bring up look all these right. these writers Le Guin as well and you're reading her writing and is this is this a book about a, a science fiction world or is this a kind of um philosophical existential mystical text about life society culture and it, it's all of those things wrapped up so is I think it's a flat world parable hmm. is this her flatlander <laughs> parable type yeah. oh yes right yeah. yeah. So uh, that, that's sort of my, my philosophy in a nutshell here. Well, I think that we're probably all very similar in that way. Um, it, that's my hope. Uh, my experience of submitting work to literary journals was so disconcerting. <laughs> I found a lot of people who don't have a lot of education or intellectual rigor, and they were very self-satisfied without it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was just like, wow, I have nothing to say to these people. <laughs> mm. <clears throat> so I stopped doing that. I was like, I'm going to wait and find journals that are really um, have this um, mind, intuition, mystic, and intellectual development sort of lineage and rigor mm. and exploration and cutting edge. So one of the things Jeremy and I have discussed, Mary, is uh, doing like editorial meetings with a with a group of editors, uh, where you know we may be managing, we may be curating um, the the journal at least at this point, uh, but we are we're plugged into or we're connected with a network of other contributor editors who you know can jump in and jump off, but really be part of that that conversation of you know, participate in that process like you described at the outset, where, you know, you throw your ideas in the air and you, you let them breathe and, um, and, you know, and, and then you co you cohere in some way and some sort of vision comes out of that, which then attracts the, the, the content that, you know, we end up, we ultimately publish. Um, so, uh, I, I don't know, um, Exactly. You know, I don't know exactly when we're going to start that up. That was a question I had I had for for Jeremy, um, and I don't need it to happen in any kind of, you know, I don't need to rush it. You know, I want I want to let it happen organically. Um, Let's but, start it next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I have the, we have the email. We were looking at it. I just haven't gotten to finalizing it and sending it out to our editor list. But we should start it. I, I think it feels right. It feels right. I think I think so. You know, so uh, are you going to try and work on a monthly um, a monthly issue cycle? What's your cycle? Uh, well, we we're, we have this concept of um, of six seven week cycles, and in within those seven weeks, we are publishing six weeks on and we're taking a week off. That's the concept, and so we we're right now in the middle of our second cycle, which. Um, uh, I called cycle one because cycle the first cycle was cycle zero, and then like each week got code numbered 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So we're in 1.4 right now. So you're publishing every week, yes. Okay, oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. That's that was what we've been doing. Um, we've but, been doing that. Um, it's, not, it's not quite like. You know, I've seen a lot of 
it's more it's more of the to, the online journal style publication, online magazine like Electric Literature, where there's yeah. weekly content and that kind of thing. Um, Re Real, um, Reality Sandwich would be another Reality example, Sandwich. but also Beams and Struts, I think, is another model. Uh, well, can where I just put out the um, idea that um, there's really something to be said for allowing people to engage in containers of a certain predictable size. So if you put, uh, publish, for example, two pieces a week for a six week period, there should be a place at which um, you can go and you can look at that issue. And the issue has a name and it has the 12 pieces together. Do you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we can say in this issue, we just discussed X, Y, Z, and people can jump onto the trolley with you at that place and get up to speed. Mm -hmm. I think that's really useful. Mm -hmm. And that that's the way that I would, I mean, I've done the traditional thing where you are a daily newspaper reporter and you have to write your 10 pieces a week and you have your deadlines and you meet them or you're dead. I've done the, you know, creating a publication that was published twice a year. I've done the four times a year publication. I've done the monthly publication. Um, and you just have to give people a rhythm that they can expect and they can wrap their minds around so they can engage the conversation with you in a chunk. Mm -hmm. And I think that for a literary journal, um, the daily model or the weekly model um, is not going to allow me to go into my sort of glial understanding, somatically speaking, which is <laughs> the neurons that wrap the neurons and they synthesize and organize everything that happens in the neurons and then they do a deeper synthesis. I need to have like a stopping place where this big chunk of information can be looked at as a group. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And to be able to plan it that way so that the, yeah. the content coming. I feel like our, our concept of the cycles originally wanted to do that over a course of six weeks with a seven week rest, a pause, and then a new theme. Uh, the way we've been doing it now is, is sort of like naming the cycle either before or usually after, like, well, what was this cycle? What was really the theme of this? So, but it would be fun. And we've talked about it too, uh, to sort of like coming out with kind of ideas for the cycle. Like um, if one of us has a kind of, and it also functions as a kind of prompt to the audience and the uh, potential. Well, that's how you get dimension. people to contribute. That's yeah. how you get people to contribute is you say, these are the themes for the next, you know, seven cycles. Yeah, and we should probably talk about this in depth um, soon. I, I got to run now, but um, Marco and, and and Mary, this was great, and I hope you can make it to the next uh, the next little meetup. Um, so the editorial is one part, um, but the other part really is that money needs to start coming in so that you yeah, because mm -hmm. everyone's gonna hit burnout. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. well, look to be continued. Do you want to stay on for a couple of minutes, Mary? I'll, I can stop recording. I've been recording this. Um, to connect with you, Jeremy, after all the crazy, crazy <laughs> conversations we've been in online. I know. <laughs> and you're like, you're very sweet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. And actually, I'm usually pretty nice most of the time, too. But I mean, we've been through some crazy, I feel like we've been through like a war together or something. <laughs> I mean, there's been quite a few Facebook threads that I remember the both of us being in. I, wow, I just I just remember, yeah, a battlefield of, of comments and the battlefield of comments and like the privilege protecting and all of the crazy and the intellectual um, constipation and oh my yeah. god and just idea defenses. It's Wow, there's a lot of. We've been through a lot. We've been through a lot. And it's really good <laughs> to keep some more. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll be through. We'll go through some more. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. I'll see you. Thanks see you. Bye bye. Nice to meet you. Bye.